So we talk about the uh, the idea of, of preparation, and, and I'll go back to, to John Flaherty as a uh, face in front of the camera. You've been doing this just long enough now that you've seen a lot of evolution in terms of social media, Facebook, Twitter. How has that affected what you do and, and you as a personality uh, and your contact with fans? Well, Twitter has changed everything. And um, yes, encourages us to have a Twitter account, uh, mainly to promote the games and raise awareness for when we're on, what the pregame show is, the regular telecast. Um, but as you all know, in the world that you live in, you now have access to us on Twitter. Uh, you can make comments to us on Twitter. And I'll be very honest, there are some comments that come that affect me directly. Uh, I was saying today that uh, I was working a game with Paul O'Neill, and one of, somebody was obviously a huge Paul O'Neill fan, and sent me a tweet during a game I was working and said, you know, just be quiet, nobody wants to listen to you, let Paul talk. And I kind of laughed and said, oh, okay, no big deal do the next half inning, check Twitter again, and this guy was just relentless the whole game. And to be honest with you, it affected me. I started thinking, you know what, maybe he's right. Maybe they don't want to listen to me, they want to listen to Paul. And I, I actually went through this, I deleted my whole Twitter account because I felt like it was affecting the job that I was doing on air. Um, one of our public relations people encouraged me to get back on Twitter because of the Yes Network and promoting the, the, the network. Um, I've learned to block people right away now when I, any negative comments come. And to tell you the truth, I'm not that active anymore on Twitter. I pay attention more for the beat writers from the Yankees to try to get some information. But Twitter has directly affected our job because when we're in the booth, fans now have access to get in the booth if we let them have access. And we've had conversations as a group to try to eliminate the bad access during the games during the innings because it can affect what you say and how you say it. No, it's very true. And by the way, I'm sorry because when I sent you those tweets about Paul, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you'd take it as harshly as you did. Um, no, but it, it really has, it changed the world. And, but you know, again, it's, this, uh, this goes back to its experience, its confidence, it's being burned enough, but yet also knowing who you are. Um, this is very important. You know, th there's a lot of things to get written. I cannot tell you, and I'm not, I'm not remote. I'm, I'm not. Le do I look like Leonardo DiCaprio to you? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things that get written about us and me in the course of a year, and some of it is dead on, spot on, true, both good and bad. And most of it is even the good stuff is exaggerated. The bad stuff is ridiculous, and you just have to be your own filter. And there are times when I don't even read it. People, of course, want me to see it, so they'll send me links, even on stuff where I know, well, I'll just see a writer, and some of them just have their own agendas. They work for other, some of them work for other television networks, to be honest with you, or they have their own agendas. They don't like the Yankees, they like whatever. And, and then vice versa, some people will always write nice things whether you deserve it or not. But you just have to get to a point where you, you know, your skin gets thick, and as you get older, it becomes a little easier to do wasn't as easy when I was younger, um, but you just deal with it either, and you treat it for you know, the imposter that it is, or you know, or if there's a point to be gleaned out of it that makes sense, then take the point out of it that makes sense. You can't make you you can't do your telecast based on one critic or some people, somebody who's living in some basement somewhere and wants to write a blog and they don't have their facts even remotely right. And there are other people that write and they make all the sense in the world. And you look at it and you go, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good criticism. <laughs> or it's a very strong observation. I mean, I, I wish I could share a tweet that a, a, we got today. It was a tweet. This was a rant from a lunatic <laughs> that we got today that was unbelievable. And it dealt with, it didn't even deal, dealt with soccer, actually, which made me feel a little bit better since yeah. I know nothing about soccer. <laughs> so that made me feel a little bit better. But it was really, honestly, this was a very frustrated soul who, you know, started with, like, they didn't like this, this, and this, which is fine. And then it morphed into something stuff that was kind of far more personal and became ultimately an attack on somebody, on all of us, and they, they were just an enraged person. People had, this person had anger issues, or whatever they were. And it was like, am I going to really take that seriously? You know, it's like, I know good from bad. I may not know a lot about soccer, but I know a good telecast from a bad one. I know a good announcer from a bad one. I know good graphics from bad graphics. I know good camera shots from bad camera shots. Again, I may not know the subtleties of the game, I'm learning. We just got it. It was not something I grew up with. 
So I, I've immersed myself to learn it as much as I can. I don't know it the way I know baseball or the way I know football, but you know it doesn't stop you from putting yourself, immersing yourself into something. But you can't take everything that's written about you or said about you for public figures, especially someone like John. And you, and you just got to we have other people that work for us, I mean, who live on this stuff. And I tell the, these people, I won't, can't mention some names, but they take it really seriously and I tell them, stop. You're driving yourself and everybody around you crazy. It's just not worth it. It's like, you know who you are and you know I don't need a, an Emmy, you know, you know, or a nomination or a gold statue when I leave a truck to know if we did a good job or not. I know from watching the telecast. I don't really need someone else to tell me that this was great or not great. I've been doing this far too long. I mean, I, there were people who said, that was the greatest game. You guys were great. It was a 4-3 game, and you know what? We missed 27 shots, and we had the replays in the wrong order, and one of the graphics was misspelled. Okay? That's not a great job. The game was great. They confuse great games with great... The, some of the greatest telecasts I've ever worked on were 14-1 to 1 baseball games. Try doing that. Try holding an audience where you're sitting there trying to, oh, how do we make this interesting? The game doesn't matter. What am I going to do to hold this audience to try to make it interesting? That is the true te litmus test. It's, I don't want to say anybody could do 4-3. I mean, we have a director of ours who came in to negotiate a deal with me, and he's telling me, you know, wow, Mariano Rivera, you know, it's like, you know, I've got an Emmy. I said, you got an Emmy for Mariano Rivera having a nervous breakdown on the mound in his last game in Yankee Stadium. You basically covered a guy having a nervous breakdown. There was no coverage, you st real coverage. You just stayed on Mariano crying. That, to me, is not directing. It's, it's common sense. I'm, he happens to be a very good director. He's a good guy. I'm not, I'm not mean to knock him. I'm just saying that, for God's sake, I mean, that's, when that's handed to you, you say, thank you very much. This is a great moment. Just cover the moment. How you document a moment is almost as important. I'll say it again. How you document a moment is almost as important as the moment itself because it's how people will remember that moment. Does anybody here who saw that game or saw clips of that game not remember Andy and, and Posada walking out to the mound and, then, and, and Rivera having a nervous breakdown, crying and couldn't help himself so his whole career flashed before his eyes? It was some incredible emotional, you'll never forget that. If you saw it, you'll never forget it. It's, again, how you cover it is how people will remember it. So how you document it becomes real. And people who overproduce or overdirect, you can kill a moment. You know, I can give you, I can go on forever here. We don't have the time for it. And I don't want to, we have other topics to cover. But I will tell you, you, you should just always keep that in mind. It's really important. And don't let other people affect you. Because at some point, you need to be your own arbiter of what's good or bad. And you need to make those decisions. And when you get to that point, then you can call yourself a true professional. Flip brings up a great point, I'm sorry Steve, but one of the biggest transitions for me is as a player, you either win the game, lose the game, you get two hits, you go for four, you strike out three times, you know if you had a good game or you had a bad game. As a broadcaster, when you walk out of the booth as a young broadcaster, I had no idea whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. As you get older, you realize when you had a good game that maybe other people won't even realize it. So experience definitely helps out in that department. And I want to stay on the topic of social media for a moment because that is, I think, right in the wheelhouse of, of a lot of the folks that we have here between communications, athletes. Uh, and John, you specifically also mentioned the word filter and your Twitter account. We're looking at it from a, an ingoing message standpoint. What do you say about the outgoing messages? Do you find that you have to be a little more careful about what you say in Twitter because maybe it's a little more of a direct medium do you have to worry about your employees and what they may be saying on social media because it spreads so quickly, it's, it's so instantaneous that uh, it's a concern and for a lot of athletes, a lot of college students that are, are coming out of this level, they have to realize that that message is going to follow them or at least it very likely will. So if, if you'd speak to that uh, briefly. I, I've actually gotten away from Twitter a little bit because I was so guarded on everything I said and I'll write tweets thinking it's funny, and then I, I erase it saying, you know what, it's not going to come off that way on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm very cautious of what I say, how I try to say it. I have three young kids at home. I'm talking to them all the time about what they're sending out on Twitter and how it can get them in trouble. Um, the one positive I will say about Twitter from all of your standpoints is there have been young adults who have gotten in touch with me through Twitter asking for interview requests. I was talking today about a, a young woman who had an online radio show, basically, and asked to interview me during the off-season one year. Had a contact with her, did an interview, 
And you know, it's access for you if you use it the right way to some of the talent to get some interviews, maybe to get your foot in the door. So there are some positives to it, but I feel from my standpoint, I try not to tweet as much as possible because I know it could get you in trouble. It will get you in trouble. Uh, personally, I can't stand it. I know it's part of what we have to do. And there's a lot of things I don't like, but you know, I, I know it's the world, the universe is changed. Mm -hmm. And you, just because I don't like it doesn't mean that it's not an accepted mode of communication or the way. I mean, the worst thing in the world, you get in an elevator at you know, whatever time it is you're going home, and or you walk down the street in New York, and all you see is this. You know, I mean, that's it. That's what you see. And to me, it's sort of like it's an anathema to communication. Now, it's going to say, wait a minute, I'm doing this, I'm communicating with somebody. That's true, you are. Are you looking them in the eye? Does, does the word body language mean anything to anybody sitting here? You can't tell body language from this. I guess LOL, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, must mean something, I suppose. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not like going down the hall and sitting in somebody's office and saying, listen, we have to talk about something. And you have a conversation, look somebody in the eye. I mean, that's, maybe that's very old school, but that's where I come from. And the fact that this stuff could be taken so out of context. You sit in somebody's office, you talk to them eye, eye to eye, if there's something they say, I don't I quite understand that. What do you mean by that? You can explain it. I don't know how you explain this. And, what, and again, people can take snippets of conversations. They can do anything they want on social media. They can send videos out. They can take things out of context. Um, I think that, you know, even what, if you follow the right people on Twitter, you could probably gleam a lot of information. And even that is narrow to me. If I follow the right sports reporters, and in the sports business, we're in the sports business. If I follow the right reporters, some of these guys are really, really very good. They do their job very well. You follow a Jack Curry. You're never going to get bad information from Jack Curry. Jack Curry's one of the best reporters. Worked at the New York Times for 20 years before he came to Yes. I mean, and he's done a really great job at Yes. He's terrific at what he does. So you follow Jack Curry, you learn something about baseball. You follow Joel Sherman, you know, you're going to learn something about the game. I mean, uh, especially if you don't know some of the personalities here, and you're just looking at the information in abstract, you'll probably learn a, a, a great deal. I mean, a that's, what, that's the use, that's what's probably good about it, is you could sit in a truck or sit in my office, and if I follow it, and you'll say, you know, so-and-so story, so-and-so is in his fourth home run of the game. Oh, that kid Chris Bryan is at it again. Chris Bryan just got set down. Then everybody's weighing in with their opinions. Uh, of people that you respect, who are in the business, who know what the hell they're talking about, what they're writing about, that's different than open to the general public. Some people will send you very educated, very detailed, very on point messages. And you look at it and say, you know what, this is very lucid and very good and very well thought out. And they're right. And there's other people that are just raving lunatics that have nothing else to do. And they'll, they'll attack you. They'll say the worst things. And it's like, really, your focus in that booth, in that truck, needs to be on that game. It can't be on. You, so there's so many screens, folks, and it shouldn't be this one. Okay? And I have, I've had it with some of our announcers. I've had it out with them about this kind of stuff. It's like, you know, you, you let some, somebody sitting, you know, 70 miles from here who doesn't like you, you know, take you out of your game. You've been totally, you got the fifth inning, when you saw that tweet or you got that email, whatever it is, you were totally different. That broadcast went totally a different direction because you stopped being who you were. And you were so distracted and taken out of a moment, you can't be taken out of it. If you're going to follow this stuff and read this stuff, then read it as a PS. You know, it's somebody in the truck should have enough wherewithal to say to you, hey, Chris Bryant just did his fourth home run of the game. Major story. We're going to go back to Bob Lorenz in the studio. He's going to give us an update, and then you guys can react off it. You know what? As opposed to, oh, Chris Bryant just did his fourth home run. OMG, great. Blah, 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 blah you know, to, to 7 million people. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, so, yes, it can be useful. It can also be terribly destructive. This is a really double-edged sword. Don't take it gospel, okay? But, you know, and there are some things you can gleam out of it, but I'm telling you, this society is really skewed now toward this, this, this device. And I, I love Steve Jobs. I had the actual honor of meeting him and spending some time with him so a, long, a while ago when my son was uh, battling an illness and he was a Make-A-Wish child. And uh, his Make-A-Wish was to meet Steve Jobs, and I got it. And, you know, my son, it was a life-altering experience for him. Plus, he's now through his cancer, so that's great news. But having said that, I found Jobs in the few minutes I met him. Fascinating. And I believe everything ever written about him. Fascinating guy. 
Change the world. I mean, Apple changed the entire world. Twitter has changed the entire world. Look at the Arab Spring. Okay? Look what happened there. But, but at the end of the day, this is also extremely destructive. And like anything, you have to control this device. Do not let this device control you.